Uh, welcome everyone uh, to the Finding Common Ground for Postal Service Reform Series. The goals of this series are one, to find opportunities to modernize, restructure, and innovate the Postal Service's supply chain. And a second goal is to look for potential new uh, uh, services or products that will uh, for the Postal Service that will meet evolving customer needs. Today's webinar is part one of this series. The focus is on pricing structure and financing regimes for the universal service obligation. Your hosts today are me, Victor Glass, and David Williams. This series is produced by the Center for Research in Regulated Industries at Rutgers Business School. Today's agenda includes three pre presentations, Simplified Pricing by Access Point by Michael Plunkett, uh, a proposal support fund for universal postal delivery by me, and Bringing Closure to Benefit Prefunding Requirements by David Williams. The first one obviously focuses on pricing. The second one, uh, the second two are on uh, funding. The presenters and discussants are, uh, you know, uh, excluding me, are uh, you can see are a really distinguished group of people from the industry that have wide experience. Uh, Larry Buck is president of SL Consulting. Uh, Jim Cochran is CEO of Parcel Shippers Association. Kenneth John is president of Postal Policy Associates. Kevin Kosar is resident scholar at American Enterprising Institute. Michael Plunkett is president and chief operating officer of Postcom. Jim Sauber, chief of staff, National Association of Letter Carriers. Michael Scanlon, partner at k &L Gates, and David Williams, visiting professor, George Mason University. The format of the panels is going to be that the presenter will, of course, start off, then followed by the discussions, uh, discussants, and after that, we'll have an open discussion. And please, if you're an attendee, submit your questions through the Q&A window so that we can pick that up. The uh, 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 person in charge of each panel will take a look at those and I'll look at it and so will Dave. And we'll try to funnel those questions to the presenter or even to the panelists. And feel free to use the chat option for offline discussion. With that, I will turn it over. Um, David, do you have anything else you want to add? No, thanks, Victor. Okay, uh, in that case, I will turn over uh, the uh, meeting to, um, uh, to the first panelist uh, um, where the presenter is Michael Plunkin. Michael, are you there? Um, Okay, he is he is trying to sign on. I know he's had some difficulty. Okay, everybody. Um, uh, this is a proposal for support fund for universal postal delivery. And the way to under uh, view this presentation is that it's a it's almost like a thought experiment. It's a to some extent out of the box way of uh, figuring out a solution to the, uh, to the roadblocks facing uh, a lot of uh, reform proposals for uh, associated with the Postal Service. It's a way of uh, getting around uh, historical uh, rulings and, um, and different interests in the industry that are basically hamstringing uh, the Postal Service from uh, uh, from producing uh, uh, services, introducing services and uh, pricing uh, its services at, um, at uh, economic costs. 
So uh, the the way I looked at this is this presentation is based on uh, looking at a cross section of essential industries in the United States and looking how th at how they price and how they fund shortfalls associated with their universal service obligation. So that's the strength of it is that it's just a cross-sectional view that sometimes when you're in one industry, uh, uh, there's a tendency not to look at the others in much depth. And again, like any, any other uh, very broad brush uh, um, proposal for reform, it is, uh, it's going to lack detail. Uh, you know, I put in some detail, but obviously if this is an interesting proposal, it would require a lot of work to make it uh, 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 realistic and um, useful. So just, uh, just that in mind. Okay, so I'm going to do this in two parts, uh, an overview and then uh, go into the details. So let me start out with some basic questions and my short answers to them. Uh, and keep in mind, I'm looking across uh, basic services, essential in industries that are network, that are network industries like uh, telecom and, and electric utilities. Can a provider of last resort operate like a normal business? That's a basic question for all these essential industries. And the answer is not completely. A provider of last resort has obligations that are often not economic. You have to serve customers that uh, in a lot of cases where individually you may not make money with them. Second, is the postal service like other providers of last resort, such as telecom companies? And my answer is no, because there are much stricter demands on the postal service uh, associated with funding operations and markets. And I'll get into details of that. So the postal service is in a much, uh, much harder uh, place to operate. And should the Postal Service's pricing strategy follow that of other uh, providers of last resort? And my answer is yes, when feasible. Uh, and for example, the Postal Service uh, uh, revenue should not be tied only to the volume of traffic delivered. In other basic services like telecom and electric utility, uh, there are other types of charges which may not be feasible in the postal service uh, for the postal service, but they're associated with access charges to the network. Finally, how should society recover postal service shortfall in a fair and efficient way? And I'm going to argue that maybe a way out of the box of, of um, you know, everybody having a position, they're, uh, they're uh, stuck in, uh, they have to uh, you know, they've made long-term decisions based on uh, current policies, maybe a universal service fund is a way out to give the postal service flexibility and have flexibility in postal delivery in general. I'm going to use two premises uh, for uh, why I'm uh, headed towards a universal service fund. And the first is going to focus on uh, to some extent, access. There are three groups of beneficiaries from postal service, the senders who obviously send mail, recipients, and the government. Senders right now are shouldering the entire load. They pay the incremental cost of what they send. Recipients are paying no nothing to get door to door, uh, uh, to the door service, but Obviously, when, when the service is free, it's awkward to collect from them, even if, if you think it's right to charge them. And as with other networked industries, delivery to the door is valuable and should have a price. 
if it weren't uh, provided automatically at birth as it is with the postal service, it would be equivalent in, in let's say telecom or electric utilities or any uh, other industry like that, it would be equivalent to having an option for directly connecting to the network. In other words, I don't. Uh, I want uh, the service to my door uh, under certain circumstances. I don't want to go elsewhere to pick up my my mail. It also has a social value associated with delivering ballots and medicine. And I bring that up because uh, if you asked a, a person how much you would you pay for postal delivery to your door, they may not include some of the social benefits, for example, uh, having ballots delivered to the home. The second premise, which is probably a little bit more controversial, is that uh, although service categories right now do cover their average incremental costs in most in, in vast majority of cases for postal services, there are still subsidies uh, among customers. And the cost of, uh, as in telecom and others, uh, uh, other industries, the cost of delivering increases with distance and decreases with uh, customer density. That's a pretty standard one. And typically in uh, cross industries, uh, uh, rural areas are likely to produce economic losses, even if wide geographic, uh, geographic averaging of costs do not. So there are going to be these islands of customers that the, uh, the, um, uh, the Postal Service uh, would lose money uh, providing service to them. And the same is true uh, and uh, in specific urban areas where physical delivery is difficult. So there may be some economic losses, even in urban areas. So the recommendation, uh, uh, as this is an overview, is to estimate the social value of door-to-door -door delivery and estimate uh, the, uh, the internal service category cross subsidies and use them to size a universal service fund. The benefits are that if you, if you have a universal service fund that recognizes these kinds of shortfalls associated with the provider of last resort obligation, well, once you've covered them, then there's no excuse for not having cost causative pricing for the rest of the customers. And secondly, here's another benefit that may be, uh, you know, uh, somewhat more controversial is that it will lead to fair pricing. For example, uh, a lot of people talk about, well, uh, Ramsey pricing, where you price, uh, you, you recover your costs by increasing prices for the least price elastic services to cover costs. Well, uh, you know, th there may be some uh, uh, fairness issues. Here, there's a special case where you have dominant services where the postal service is the only one uh, um, that provides them. And I don't know the details, but there may be a, an incentive to raise margins on the dominant services to cover all costs. Uh, and is it realistic to have a universal service fund? And my answer is, uh, if you look at other industries, uh, the answer is yes. Telecom has uh, support funds for the universal service obligation. The transport, uh, transport uh, industry Roads uh, have uh, huge support funds uh, uh, that are given out annually. Okay, so let me go into the details uh, now that you've seen the overall picture. So what is a, a typical uh, provider of last resort obligation? It's universal, uh, and this goes back to England. And in fact, uh, there's a discussion of it in Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations. So this is, these are not new ideas. Uh, a universal availability of a service, comparable quality in all areas is typical. You want a resilient network that stays up 
that uh, delivers what it's supposed to deliver. And a recent requirement that uh, goes back in telecom to, uh, I'd say probably the early 50s, is comparable services, at, uh, maybe the 40s, comparable services at comparable rates in rural and urban areas. So those are the uh, uh, provider of last resort obligations. And they're certainly not the obligations of a typical for-profit company. And I looked at the postal services obligation in rural areas just to see how comparable it was to uh, telecom. And I saw this uh, US code 101 and it says that the postal service shall provide a maximum degree of effective regular postal services to rural areas and communities uh, uh, where post offices are not self-sustaining. So uh, it, it already recognizes that there are certain areas where, uh, where the business may not turn a profit. And no, po a, a small, uh, no small post office shall be closed solely for operating at a deficit. Again, that is not the way an ordinary business operates. And uh, when I started to uh, get involved with uh, the postal industry, one thing that, uh, that struck me that was um, uh, pretty unusual is that the Postal Service, uh, um, the Postal Regulatory Commission has targets that are hard to evaluate, uh, unlike other uh, uh, providers of last resort. In telecom, uh, the uh, people know how much it will more or less know how much it will cost to provide service to particular areas. Here, there are all sorts of uh, 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 value propositions that are hard to measure. And I just picked out a few. Objective, uh, there are 10 objectives uh, and 14 uh, factors that the Postal Regulatory uh, Commission uses to evaluate uh, the Postal Service's performance. Objective seven, to enhance mail security and deter terrorism. I don't know how much that costs, but it, these are just things that jumped out at me. Factor three, the effective rate increases upon the general public business mail users and enterprises in the private sector of the economy engaged in the uh, delivery of mail matters other than le uh, letters. So the, uh, so the Postal Service has to figure out what the effect is on the general public it could be, uh, uh, you know, some social costs there. Uh, factor eight, the relative value uh, to the people of kinds of mail matters entered into the postal system and the desirability and justification for special classifications and, uh, and services of mail. The final one, factor 11, the educational, cultural, scientific, and informational value to the recipient of mail matter. I don't know how anybody can figure that one out. So there are a lot of these objectives that, uh, you know, uh, factors that, uh, you know, it, it's in the eye of the beholder. So, and, and then I looked at the, you know, once I got to uh, understand a little bit about uh, the postal service, it's not organized at all like other providers of last resort. Telecom companies have stockholders. Uh, postal service does not. There are limits on borrowing. Obviously, if you don't have stockholders, you don't have equity, and now you have limits on borrowing. Then you have limits on service expansion needs to be approved by outsiders who may, uh, may or may not have the expertise like upper management uh, to, uh, to decide whether something is good or not. And uh, as a sidebar, it, uh, keep in mind, in, in, in Europe, uh, the Postal Service has a monopoly on mail, but there appears no one wants uh, that, that, uh, that's, uh, uh, to have that obligation, at least in Europe. There were some companies that tried to uh, deliver mail, and then they pulled out and stuck to the parcel uh, uh, market. OK, so the proposal details. What am I saying? I, I, I'd say that what you'd like to shoot for 
is to use average incremental cost for pricing. That's, that's the equivalent of marginal cost pricing. You'd like to act, uh, estimate the price of access to, uh, in other words, to the door delivery. Uh, so you can, because that's a separate service. And you wanna fund shortfalls through a support fund. That's, that's the basic idea. Now, the devil of course is always in the details. And how do you estimate these things? For access, you could do special studies. In telecom, uh, this was done by developing a simulation model of the cost of delivering uh, a broadband service to every census block in the United States. And that was the way of figuring out what the cost of providing service is. You could, uh, of course, use a kind of a top-down approach, which uh, would be a controversial, where you could just look at revenues from usage and retirement funds. And I put in retirement funds because one of the, uh, uh, um, David Williams is going to go over some of the issues with retirement funds. But here are two sources of revenue. You would figure out the cost of, uh, of, of usage, other common and joint costs, and the cost of retirement funds, figure out a, sh a funding shortfall. And that would be the start off for the, uh, for the size of the universal service fund. To some extent that was done in telecom where uh, uh, at least in certain areas. So uh, next question is, is the universal service uh, funding atypical? And the answer is no, telecom, I just picked off one. Uh, the federal government devotes billions to internet access. And uh, I, I left a link there, and uh, there is, uh, there are a, uh, a high, um, well, there's a, there's a new fund for telecom uh, to uh, improve broadband access throughout the country. And in transportation, there's the Highway Trust Fund that has roughly 50 billion a year, and it's growing. Uh, so it's not atypical. Now, how now the you know I'm assuming the funds are available. The a real big question is how to how to fund is an ongoing problem for all pro providers of last resort. And here are some of the issues. Suppose you like a universal service fund. The problem is you don't want it to be determined politically each year. In telecom, there's a basic calculation. Uh, each year to determine the shortfall. So you need, you need a kind of calculation that, that doesn't require all sorts of political bargaining. Uh, that's a difficult issue. And uh, how, to, uh, how to gather the funds, uh, that uh, in telecom, that's a, a problem here, perhaps a line item on, the in, on income tax, federal income tax, there may be other ways of doing it. I really, uh, I'm just throwing those out. Should it be limited to the postal service, this funding? The answer to me, uh, the answer is yes, because it shoulders the provider of last resort obligation. Uh, it, it, there, was, uh, there was an attempt in telecom to, uh, to offer funding to uh, several providers of last resort, and that proved to be wasteful because if if it's an uneconomic area why do you have several uh, uh competitors providing uh provider of last resort uh services in those areas should the funding piggyback on other programs and there i say yes for example the uh from what i gather the uh postal service has the second largest fleet of uh of uh, vehicles in the United States beyond, behind the military. And if you tap into the, uh, there's a lot of EV funding that's being uh, 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 appropriated, not simply by the federal government, but also by states, uh, it would be a good idea to tap into some of these other funding sources. So the conclusion is uh, a universal service fund has a lot of advantages. It recognizes the Postal Service requires funds to meet targets that an ordinary business customer would not be required to meet. 
it's consistent with economic uh, theory. It places value on the option to have mail and parcels delivered to the door. And it, uh, it allows the postal service to price at uh, average incremental cost for its services. It's consistent with support funding for other essential services. The challenges are to size the fund correctly uh, and in a way that allows the postal service to plan effectively. That is going to be a big issue. So with that, I am uh, I'm finished and I will turn it over to uh, Michael Plunkett. Thank you, Victor. I apologize to the uh, panelists and discussants and uh, attendees for my tardiness and my um, lack of fundamental competence with technology that prevented my arriving on time. Uh, I was listening on the phone and of course I had access to uh, Victor's presentation beforehand. Uh, so I have had plenty of time to familiarize myself with it and appreciate the approach and the, uh, the attempt to apply some new thinking to how uh, the postal system can be funded. Uh, and I, I thought I would start out the discussion part of this by posing uh, a, a couple of questions uh, for Victor. And I'd, I'd invite Kevin Kosar, if he's on, to jump in as well. And, and the first question is, you know, there's a difference, of course, between the Postal Service and telecom companies, for example, in that the Postal Service, being a government agency, might be perceived uh, to be providing uh, not necessarily a service, but something that uh, recipients consider to be a basic fundamental government right. And would that make it, how would that affect the ability or the um, practicality of implementing uh, this approach, given that basic difference in, in postal operations? Well, my answer to that one is that that's the key reason for a universal service fund. It has obligations that it can't escape. Uh, many of them are not, uh, 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 will not produce profits. So how do you recover those costs? Well, you need, you need a fund that recognizes that uh, there are going to be shortfalls in, in uh, in normal operations. So I think, I think it, whether it's a government agency or, uh, or a, a telecom company, uh, uh, the answer is the same. Thank you, Victor. I guess another question I, I wonder if you've thought about is one of the things that's been elusive in recent years as the Postal Service has faced volume declines in its mail business is uh, productivity gains and uh, e efficiency gains. Can you talk, have you, or if you thought about it, could you talk about what possible efficiency effects might arise from the Postal Service um, receiving direct governmental funding in this way, which is, of course, very different from the way Universal Service is funded today through, through postage? Well, my answer is, and I mentioned it briefly in the presentation, is once you have the universal service fund, then the postal service has no excuse for operating as if it were a uh, market driven company. So in other words, it, it, it can no longer say, well, I, uh, I need to jack up prices on a particular customers to, to cover revenue shortfall. You can, you can, you can say that they now can move towards marginal average incremental cost pricing. So in a lot of ways, a universal service fund could improve the uh, quality of competition, not have price distortions, and it would, uh, it would force the postal service to look for the least cost way of providing service. And the, uh, the universal service fund uh, size may uh, over time should take into account uh, uh, other opportunities, for example, work sharing uh, and other opportunities for reducing costs. 
that's very good. And now, now I have another question, which is um, more about sort of um, customer perceptions. Um, and this, I think, arises not just from uh, customers being used to getting free mail delivery, but customers are, I think, conditioned to believe that the costs of getting things is zero, um, partly due to the proliferation of free, you know, quote, free, unquote, shipping uh, from online retailers. Even though customers are indirectly paying for um, that delivery, either in the cost of the product or sometimes through direct shipping and handling charges. Um, how do you overcome that sort of perception problem that uh, customers are, are, or recipients are just accustomed to believing that um, that's something that they, they should get for nothing, even though if in reality they are paying for it? Well, that's, that's a, a pricing strategy and, uh, you know, the, Suppose, suppose uh, uh, let's let's take Amazon versus some other company. Another company could uh, could work with the postal service and uh, and uh, develop uh, arrangements where they can mimic what Amazon is doing. Uh, that's that's one possibility. So that from a customer's perspective, it may look like it's free. Um, Instead of uh, instead of being charged uh, for postal delivery, there are other ways that uh, you know. For example, Amazon, that uh, the postal service, uh, and this may be far afield, is that the, uh, Amazon also recovers a lot of its costs through data. It gathers data and sells it. Well, uh, uh, with uh, if you want to put the postal service on a more equal footing with Amazon, for example, well, they, they should be able to uh, collect and uh, uh, use data, uh, market data in, in, uh, in, a, in a competitively neutral way with other, with other companies. Thank you, Victor. And, and I should not uh, hog all of the available time and I should uh, turn things over maybe to Kevin Kosar, who I assume probably has some much better questions than I do. I think I see him there. Kevin, you have to turn on your microphone. I guess we do not. I see him on my participants list. Uh, Max, if uh, he may have signed in in a different way. He did. I just promoted him to a panelist. He should okay. be able to join soon. Okay. There we go. Okay, good. Just just when you think you couldn't be outdone in technological incompetence, Mike, <laughs> I beat you. <laughs> Always uh, one-upping people. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, uh, Victor, thank you for having me here. We haven't met previously, so I, I appreciate being invited uh, to this conversation. And, and I, I think your topic is super important. Um, you know, when the Postal Service was created in 1970, you know, every time I go back to look at that original statute, I'm amazed at the aspirations Congress had for it. There are so many objectives and goals and wishes for this government entity to fulfill. And they were under the operating assumption that mail volume would keep going up, revenues would keep going up, and all these goals were going to be satisfied. And the whole question of you know a universal service cost and whether the public should in some way, shape, or form pay for that, or even if we should account for that, they kind of muddled through that. And eventually, you know, the, the universal service appropriation just disappeared. And now we're in a different world. And the question of how do we make sure this entity is adequately funded is, uh, is paramount. Uh, and it's not getting much attention on the Hill, um, quite frankly. And so I'm, I'm thrilled that you've done some out of the box thinking and we're drawing upon other industries to help us figure this, this thing out. I guess the first thing I, I want to do is to kind of double back to a, a point that, that Michael made um, on efficiency. 
Um, you know, as we all know, the Postal Service is one of about 18 government corporations that exist. This kind of progressive era idea was that, you know, you, you have certain services that the public should get um, and the best way to deliver them is by creating a government version of a corporation where, you know, it's user fees and that sort of thing that support the entity. And the Postal Service was switched over to that model um, from being just a regular appropriated government agency in 1970, in part because it was viewed as really inefficient. Namely, the Postal Service didn't have the incentives to manage its costs. Um, Congress did any number of things that made it hard for the Postal Service to do that, uh, to say nothing of price its, its goods and services. But the thinking was that, you know, Postal Service, like other government corporations, would be incentivized to be uh, efficient if they had to worry about not breaking even, um, if they could in some way go, go broke, that this would create pressures upon them. And so that kind of leads me to the question of, you know, with the creation of a universal service fund, would that cut into those incentives? Would it make it easier for the Postal Service to kind of just, you know, let more and more costs each year get shifted over to the Universal Service Fund um, or not? Well, that's, that's always an issue uh, with, uh, with a support fund. Uh, the answer is that uh, once, once you have the support fund in place, there should be a, a more clear-cut criteria for judging the performance of management. Uh, um, you know, they can't any longer say that they, uh, uh, you know, they're losing money here, so we have to cross-subsidize here. Uh, uh, we don't have enough funding for uh, for investments or something like that. So I, I, I don't say that a universal service fund is a cure-all, uh, but it at least uh, gives you the uh, supposedly the funding to operate like a uh, like another typical corporation would have the, enough funding for investment. It could price correctly. So now the focus could be more on management. Are, are you really, uh, why aren't you meeting these types of targets? Don't tell me that you don't have enough funds to modernize. Uh, 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 so, but of course, if, if the Universal Service Fund is co-opted by, uh, by uh, uh, political interests, well, you could have a problem there. So you need to have safeguards on the Universal Service Fund itself because uh, the, uh, all of the conflicts could spill over to the funding. Right, right, right. Um, I, I, one thing in your presentation that a lot of things in your presentation stuck out to me, but one thing that really got in my brain was uh, the kind of social value aspect of it. And one thing that's tucked in the 1970 law is collective bargaining, unionization, and the aspiration that those who go to the work for the postal service would basically be getting a pathway to middle class compensation. Um, and that, you know, seems to be a key part of this. Um, because last I checked, the Postal Service's annual operating costs uh, were somewhere between like 70 and 75 percent compensation, um, which is obviously driven in part by this social value that was placed on that. Um, in other industries, do we have that same sort of, that, that have universal service funds, do we have that same feature of kind of unionization, high well, levels of yeah, telecom, telecom has unions. Uh, they've been slowly uh, 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 being reduced as technology has been introduced. So, uh, uh, of course, uh, you know, unions are uh, uh, 
one of those issues. They provide security. They uh, 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 you have generally lower turnover rate. Um, they uh, they have skills, but of course, uh, if if there isn't uh, if there isn't a uh, some incentive in collective bargaining to keep those uh, to keep uh, the terms and conditions uh, associated with uh, a union in check, then of course uh, you could you could see uh, just uh, salaries and other benefits increasing. So that's that's one of the other challenges that would be associated with universal service reform. On the other hand, if you, if you allow the uh, if you don't allow the postal service to operate uh, um, effectively, well, over time, uh, the Postal Service is likely to lay off a lot of people or not, uh, or not uh, uh, increase slots. So I think it's in the, in the union's advantage uh, uh, to be part of a, uh, a, a plan, including universal service fund, to, uh, to, to make a new start. So um, at least gives some flexibility there. I don't, uh, again, once again, there are a lot of uh, problems in the details and it, it may, it may uh, uh, and uh, these need to be fleshed out. I don't have the answers to them, uh, but I think that each side, uh, if, with a universal service fund, there's a potential win-win for uh, not only the union postal service, competitors, uh, uh, people who want to use the, uh, the network. Uh, so at least opens a new uh, type of dialogue. Right, right. Yeah, and I appreciate your point about the wicked difficult um, problem of how do you fund the universal service fund? Because it's not particularly attractive to go back to an annual appropriation, which realizing the congressional appropriations process is a mess now, we, you know, get last second omnibus bills. This is this creates great uncertainty and that would not be an, an attractive thing. I, I had a question about the, um, in terms of calculating the universal service fund, would we need to, um, for, as part of that first, take account of some of the explicit subsidies that are kind of baked into um, some of the mail, you know, some of the mail classes. Yes. And, okay. Uh, the uh, uh, for example, in telecom, there's this simulation model that uh, uh, uses forward-looking technology and costs to provide service to each census block in the United States, and they can tell from that uh, that simulation model. I'm not I'm not a tremendous fan of simulation models, but uh, they can be useful to some extent where you can find out uh, areas where, uh, where uh, uh, you know, the provider of last resort obligation is leading to losses. So you can do that. Okay. Uh, I no doubt could pitch you other questions, but I don't want to hog all the time. Uh, so I'll hand it back to Michael or we'll open it up to others. What would you like to do? Well, I wanted to jump in with a, more of an observation than a question, but invite people to comment on it. Um, I think one of the primary opponents to um, a universal service fund would be the postal service itself. Um, I think for good reason, they would tend to bristle at the possibility of greater interference from Congress were such a fund to exist. Um, and the postal service finds itself really very recently having the best of both worlds, a government monopoly, and yet lacks regulation that allows them to set almost whatever prices they want on its monopoly products. It, would, it seems to me it would be very difficult to get the Postal Service to be willing to come to the table to consider a universal service fund in the current environment where, um, you know, some underlying structural challenges notwithstanding, um, the future, the immediate future for them looks pretty good. Well, I, uh, you know, I can't speak for the Postal Service. Uh, I mean, if, 
if if a universal service fund seems reasonable to a lot of the uh, interests in the industry and to uh, and uh, to the government of uh, the uh, Congress, then I think uh, uh, they may they may have an incentive to uh, uh, to come to the table. Um, Dave Williams just told me that uh, we're about uh, time is up. Is, um, is there any last question? If I may just ask real quick, um, could you give a couple examples of how other universal service funds get get the money flowed in there and how those money flows are adjusted each year? Yes, uh, uh, let, me, whatever let me do it for telecom. Uh, it, it was built into uh, the divestiture that the funds came from, a, uh, from long distance services. So there was a fee uh, attached to long distance service that was uh, that funds the universal service fund in telecom. There's a problem with that because long distance service is going away. There are, uh, there are uh, um, proposals, including one by me, uh, to extend the base to uh, 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 to uh, uh, communication services in general. So yes, that's that's another issue. Uh, how to do it? And uh, once again, uh, you uh, uh, the best of all worlds is not to to minimize the politicization of the universal service fund and to find a source that would bypass having to go to Congress every year. And uh, those are some of the challenges. Um, if we have time, we have a question that one of the um, uh, attendees submitted to me. And it's about whether or not um, a universal service fund uh, creates any possibility of uh, unfair competition since the Postal Service uh, does compete in package markets. Well, the answer is that the Universal Service Fund is supposed to cover just the, um, uh, the uh, costs of its provider of last resort obligation. So from that perspective, once that's sized, then the, uh, uh, the Postal Service and the competitors should be on an equal footing. The competitors keep in mind, uh, for example, Amazon, uh, can provide uh, a service, a package delivery service in densely populated areas. So they can pick and choose, uh, uh, you know, from the postal services point of view, uh, they would probably say that's cream skimming. So once you have the fund, then a lot of these issues uh, go away and, um, but it has to be done carefully so that uh, it's competitively neutral. So I, uh, I think that's a legitimate concern. All right, I see uh, uh, former Governor Williams looking at his clock, so I assume we're out of time. I wanna uh, thank Victor uh, and Kevin for joining me on this panel uh, and, and starting us off. Uh, and again, with uh, another apology for my uh, inability to get connected on time. Now, uh, Michael, um, uh, just uh, since we didn't start off with you, does it make sense to have Dave Williams' presentation on uh, on another source of funding? Then we'll come back to you. How's that? I, I yield any rights to complain about anything, so uh, by all means. <laughs> Dave, are you okay uh, going from here? I'm okay, but I don't think Jim Salber's joined us yet. Okay, um, so then... Well, Michael, I, then uh, take it away. You're next. I'm ready to go then. Uh, let's see. Hey, Vic, if we have a moment just while Mike's pulling up his presentation, just, just a comment um, on the last discussion, which I, I think is helpful, and I appreciate your framing this as a, as a thought experiment. I mean, whether a universal service fund is the right mechanism or whether there's other uh, other avenues that should be explored. I mean, I do think there's a fundamental question of how do we continue to sustain a postal network that has all of these positive um, externalities? And I think in some respects, I think maybe the presentation is teed it up to the wonder inclusive, but I don't think it's just senders and recipients of the government to benefit. I think if you look around and 
the PRC has done a lot of work, the Urban Institute and others. I mean, a lot of communities, both economically, socially, and politically, I mean, the Postal Service plays an outsized role where the, the old model of having ratepayers fund that entirely is really, I think, under some stress. I, I do think the concerns in terms of what does it do for efficiency and the point Mike Plunkett raised with respect to valuation issues in the world of sender pays and free shipping, how do you appropriately frame that? But I think the, the unavoidable question is, and we'll get into some of this, I think, in Dave's panel and some in Mike's discussion next, is, you know, how do you fund this kind of critical role that the Postal Service plays uh, for a lot of these r rural and remote communities that don't otherwise have affordable alternatives, um, both as an economic lifeline in the pandemic, as a uh, kind of a social lifeline in a very real sense. And how do you do that? And you, know, you, have, you have one set of products, and this is, I think, in part with what you're getting at, which you know, are, are, in, are in fact monopoly products. And is it fair to continue to extract uh, more and more rents from those products who don't have alternatives? On the other side of the house, you have the Postal Service running a competitive products package business. But those products, of course, are subject to market discipline. And if you try to force prices on those products above competitive levels, you wind up, I think, harming the very constituency that you're trying to protect by forcing those volumes out and raising prices on the businesses and consumers who rely on the system. So it's an interesting question. You know, one thing that, that springs to mind for me is, you know, there is some current congressional uh, focus on a post reform bill. But does it go far enough in really addressing those questions and really getting at some of the root causes as to why uh, ratepayers are under such stress, both on the letter mail side and also on the package side? And I think maybe the, the rest of the conversation today will explore that. But but thanks for teeing it up. I thought it was an interesting discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Michael. Um, I can you see my slide yeah. here on the screen? Yep. Great. Um, a couple of things before I get started. Um, first, I want to thank Victor for the opportunity to talk about a subject that I've really been pushing for and thinking about even back when I worked at the Postal Service. Um, so apparently I, I should have tried harder or been more effective. Uh, and, you know, you learn things every day. And I learned this morning that after 15 months uh, of not dealing with anybody in public, I have completely forgotten how to manage a necktie. So that explains why I'm not uh, better dressed for today's presentation. Uh, I want to start off uh, before I get into the, the topic at hand with some necessary disclaimers. I'm going to talk about uh, an approach to pricing that I think could benefit the Postal Service and the entire postal system. But it's my point of view. It doesn't reflect uh, a position uh, of either of the associations that I work for. Uh, these are my ideas. Um, and they're based on uh, observations as a practitioner way back when, and uh, trends that I think uh, have changed a little bit over the last 10 years and that I see uh, possibly accelerating. And it's I, I have to make the um, unfortunate point that uh, this presentation will probably have the shortest shelf life of anything I've ever done as tomorrow morning or afternoon, perhaps, I think the Postal Service is probably going to do something that moves even further away from what I'm going to talk about. Um, and lastly, I, I would have felt more confident expounding on this subject a year ago because um, you know, the Postal Service is in the midst of a pretty significant shift in the nature of its business, arriving uh, in part from sort of an acceleration of long-term trends on mail decline and uh, an explosion in demand for uh, packaged services, partly as a result of the um, COVID pandemic. I think we're still uh, in the midst of that, and I don't think it's entirely clear yet what the future looks like. I think we see recent evidence that mail is rebounding somewhat um, which I think is, is positive for everybody involved, but uh, I think still too early uh, to say that things are going to get back to normal anytime soon. So with that sort of basic housekeeping out of the way, I want to just sort of do a little background work here. And, you know, we, we, we're two decades into the 21st century, yet for the most part, mail is very much priced like it was uh, back in 1970. In fact, even before that, I, I, tend to think of 1970 as the emergence of the modern postal service because of the Postal Regu uh, Reorganization Act. Um, and for the most part, mail prices are derived from single piece first class mail rates and with based on this 
default notion rooted in 1970 that the Postal Service had a natural monopoly and owned, because of that monopoly, uh, the handling, processing, and delivery of mail from the point of origin and all the way through destination. Uh, it made sense at the time, and it served as the foundation for uh, a lot of history that today creates a lot of inertia. And so as mail was really growing and expanding, the pressure on the postal service to sort of keep up with demand and maintain efficiencies, I think led to some really, uh, really significant uh, breakthroughs and innovation in pricing as the postal service looked to uh, work sharing to sort of meet the growing demands for mail. Um, now, what I would say though, is that as mail has started to decline, um, that's a, a phenomenon that we're living with. And I don't think postal pricing has kept up in the way that it has needed to. And I think um, we're past the time to consider a new perspective because I do think there is a future in mail. Uh, it might never return to what it once was, but I think there are some uh, latent and untapped opportunities uh, that I think could be uh, opened up with a different approach. And that's what I'm gonna talk about. And you know, this arises, I believe, from the fact that um, in the last 51 years, a lot has changed, right? And these are things that everyone is intimately familiar with. Mail is not used for the same reasons it was back in 1970. Uh, its role in uh, as a medium for personal correspondence is greatly reduced thanks to electronic alternatives. And the sort of uh, infrastructure used to develop mail has changed fundamentally. Um, the advent of uh, computing and uh, complex logistics services uh, has really changed the mail ecosystem in a way that the role of the Postal Service doesn't need to be the same as it needed to be back in 1970. And we know that um, there are many private operators performing upstream activities uh, in handling uh, pre-sortation, uh, logistic services, who can uh, exceed Postal Service performance for a number of uh, fairly obvious reasons. They have easier access to capital, they have uh, less restrictions on their ability to make decisions and to adapt to changes in their environment. And so they have built-in advantages. And, uh, and that's not a criticism of the Postal Service, it's a feature of how they're structured and how they operate. And of course, as we've seen in the recent release of the Postal Service's 10-year plan, the Postal Service is making a necessary pivot to its package business. Packages are growing, mail is declining. It is sort of a natural uh, evolution of their business. Um, but I think there's a risk that if pricing isn't thought about differently, mail might get left behind and uh, there'll be some opportunities that are left off the table. And so uh, my basic point here is that um, as volume disappears from the network, increasingly a smaller and smaller pool of commercial postal customers are forced to fund um, these middle mile or upstream activities that are in many cases not necessary anymore. And uh, that's, that's creating some negative service consequences. And it is uh, creating an incentive for customers who have alternatives to exit the system at an accelerating rate. And so in the absence of a universal service fund like Victor was talking about, the, the pool of resources able to fund universal service I think we'll get increasingly under threat. Uh, so what I, I think I wanna talk about as an alternative is upending postal pricing for mail and thinking about how to um, create a product or a set of products uh, that is based on how commercial customers prefer and need to access the postal services network. And uh, to support my argument, I want to point to um, what I would say is easily the Postal Service's most successful effort in the last 30 years. I think we have uh, one of the primary architects of that on the call, and that is the Postal Service's introduction uh, and a rapid expansion of its ground pa package business through Parcel Select. Uh, didn't start in 2010, but back in 2010, it was a modest part of the Postal Service's product offering at only $130 million. This year, it's probably gonna push past 10 billion. 
in overall postal revenues. Uh, as, the po as the new Postmaster General likes to point out, because it arrives at a delivery unit ready to go, it gets remarkable on-time service performance, far better than any other uh, postal product. And it is pretty darn profitable for the Postal Service. In 2020, it had uh, almost a 200% cost coverage, not bad for a competitive product. And I would argue the reason this product has been so successful is it really focuses in on what the Postal Service does exceedingly well and better than anybody else. And that is last mile delivery, mostly to um, residential addresses. That's the Postal Service's reason for existence. It's their sweet spot. And they have leveraged that to create a really, really incredible product. Um, and they've uh, used, in, again, not a criticism, I think an inevitable result. And they're having to compete for this market has also led them to develop some innovative approaches to pricing. And as often happens when the Postal Service does anything because of the size of their network, uh, it built a new industry essentially around consolidation of uh, small quantity shipments uh, to create a sort of a secondary industry uh, unto itself. And uh, that has produced significant benefits to the Postal Service, to consumers, and to mailers because increasingly this product contributes a significant amount to the provision of universal service for all postal products. So if it works in packages, um, why wouldn't it work for mail? Which is my sort of fundamental question here. And the reason I think it could work for mail in ways that weren't feasible maybe 50 years ago are for some external uh, developments that I think, again, are, are pretty familiar to everybody. Uh, mail largely exists, well, especially commercial mail, uh, exists in some electronic form well before it ever becomes a physical product, not to mention when it needs to get uh, entered into the postal network. So uh, there's a lot of different ways to produce, um, develop and enter mail that didn't exist 50 years ago. And uh, I would argue the system would be improved and much more efficient if the Postal Service uh, took advantage of some of those developments by pricing its products differently. And here's the basic pitch and approach uh, on how this could work. And I think I would argue these could be done effectively today, even under the current regulatory regime, uh, even given the current uh, postal product set that exists today, but could be uh, optimized or would need to be optimized by a rethinking of mail products in general. I, I think a key step, of course, is to decouple commercial products from uh, consumer single piece first class mail. Uh, I think that uh, artifact pricing that uh, pertains today is just that, an artifact that isn't necessary anymore. And you know, the, the consequence of having all prices derived uh, from first class single piece is that the prices are derived in a top-down manner, which means the default assumption is that customers should and must pay for an end-to-end -end product that mm -hmm. for the most part, commercial users of mail neither need nor want. And a better approach, I would argue, would be to uh, up upend or rethink that approach and build commercial mail prices from the bottom up by creating the default assumption that letters, uh, the best price is for letters that are entered as close to destination as possible given the structure of the Postal Services network and in a fashion that enables efficient processing. And for the purposes of argument, I would propose today, those are um, letters, and I could say the same for flats, but I'll focus on letters, letters that are essentially DPS ready. They can be turned over the Postal Service given one pass and then be ready for delivery. Uh, that approach I believe would um, open the way for the Postal Service to uh, rethink how it sets prices and create opportunities to optimize prices by different variables. And I've listed a few of them here today um, that I think could technically be done using the current approach, but that I think are a little more different and I'm going to do a, what appears to be a um, 
minor digression. On a talk I did on costs a few months ago, I used the analogy of um, a sculpture. And I talked about if I were tasking some with, someone with building a statue of Julius Caesar, and I gave them two choices. One would be to um, use marble, and so you would have to carve it from a large block of stone, or you could use Legos and you could build it using small units and build it from the ground up. Arguably, you could get a perfectly rendered um, statue of Julius Caesar using either approach, right? But if I changed my mind halfway through and decided that instead of a statue of Julius Caesar, I wanted a statue of say Tom Brady, uh, if I'm using marble, I have to start completely from scratch and I've wasted uh, who knows how much effort. Whereas if I've got Legos, I can easily disassemble them and reconfigure them to be whoever I want it to be. And I would argue you'd say the same thing about prices. By focusing on smaller units, I think it would have uh, opened the door to greater creativity and uh, more thoughtful approaches to pricing that are just more inherently more difficult using the approach that exists today. I also think there are inevitably some uh, positive service consequences. We know from history that any mail that gets entered close to destination has a much better chance of being delivered on time than mail that gets into, entered upstream. And I think something that is harder to quantify but uh, almost undeniably significant is the positive environmental benefits from inducing downstream entry. According to the Postal Service's own estimates, it's long haul transportation operates at about 42% of capacity. That's a lot of expensive uh, fuel being used to drive around empty space. And because mail, again, is, is generally in electronic form at some point, uh, you could easily induce downstream entry and avoid a lot of that um, wasteful and inefficient and unnecessary transportation. Now, I'm talking about this and I, I have to acknowledge that this is a long shot and it's a long shot for some very, I think, obvious and legitimate reasons. And I think I used the term inertia when I talked about the history that's been built up over the last 50 years. That is not just in the structure itself, but it's in the entire system of individuals and companies uh, who exist in our industry. Uh, clearly the Postal Service uh, is um, you know, not the not the fastest operator in the world. I think we would all acknowledge that. We have a regulator that is heavily invested in the current system and has exhibited um, uh, a reluctance to, to turn on a dime, let's say. But I'm not gonna excuse or um, uh, lay all the blame on the operator and the regulator. I think there's a lot of risk aversion in the mailing industry that um, everyone is fairly comfortable. If you are still in the mailing industry, you've made a success out of the current system. And any attempt to change that system uh, is understandably a source of concern and possible risk. And so these are well-founded and real challenges to any attempt to try to rethink pricing. Um, and of course, the customers, uh, you know, they're, they complain a lot. I complain a lot and I'm one of them, um, but they kind of like things the way they are. And I think customers recognize that if you instituted any significant change in the way the postal service approaches pricing or product design or anything else, there would be winners and losers and customers would naturally be uh, fearful of ending up on the wrong side of that line. And so um, there's a lot of um, things preventing us from thinking about different approaches here. I'm aware of those and I wish I could offer obvious solutions to those, but um, don't have those. And then, you know, a more recent phenomenon is it, it seems to be at odds with, I think, a unspoken but real shift in the Postal Service's strategy. Um, more than once I've heard uh, Postmaster General DeJoy uh, lament the fact that a lot of his trucks are empty and talk about actually trying to fill the trucks. Now that's not an outright uh, declaration of intent 
to scale back work sharing, but it has kind of an ominous uh, sound to make it seem like the Postal Service wants to perhaps crawl back more of those upstream activities than it has lost over the years. And as with anything, and it, I think this was true in Victor's discussion, um, there's political resistance to anything. And um, we're probably on the verge of some postal legislation. It doesn't really do much to pricing that I can see, but it would sort of harden uh, the current system, I think, even more than it is today. So uh, plenty of obstacles already and perhaps more emerging at any time. Uh, I think I've gone on at length and have come to the end of my presentation. I, again, appreciate the opportunity to get up on my soapbox and to talk about, again, something that I've been thinking about for a while. Realize that um, it's got a, a devoted but very small uh, set of adherents. And so I look forward to um, questions and discussion from Larry and others. Larry, I think you're muted. I didn't know I was a discussant. But Michael, I think you just I think made a Jim very- Jim Cochran is, uh, isn't he? Oh. Right. Yeah, I think Jim Cochran is the other discussion. Let, let me just open up uh, before I turn it over to Jim, who's a real expert on this, but just say thanks, Mike, for, for an interesting presentation. I think it uh, it does cut across a number of different lines of inquiry. I mean, costing issues, pricing issues, I think strategic issues for the Postal Service in terms of their direction. And, and I also think it implicates some of the broader policy issues that, that Vic's presentation also addressed. Uh, on, on the costing issue, I mean, I think there's, you know, some separate questions. One is how you collect information on costs for commercial letter mail products and, and separately kind of how you use that costing information uh, to price them. And I think the discussion of bottoms up costing is interesting. You know, when Dave Williams was at the OIG, the OIG wrote some greenfield costing papers in terms of thinking about ways to leverage technology or otherwise look at, at, at bottoms up costing. Um, and the sculpture analogy is interesting, although, you know, arguably if you're doing it correctly, it's not clear you should end up in a very different place, whether you're whether you're building from the bottom up on costing or whether you're modeling avoided costs from an end to end service. And I do think there's some room for encouragement in the letter mail side of the house in terms of the experience with standard mail dropship and even with respect to first class mail pre-sort, where there is a lot of this where in a sense you're trying to incentivize more efficient preparation further downstream for the postal service so they can uh, minimize costs and, and get the same contribution out of the pieces. Um, so on the technology piece, you, you know, it's interesting. I think that there probably is room over time uh, for improvement there, or although, um, you know, I think you need to be careful. I mean, we, we've seen some recent examples where citing to technology as a way to do costing isn't always as accurate as it could be. I think I was impressed with Postcom's comment that a sample of a sample isn't, isn't really a reliable source for, for regulatory costing purposes, uh, which I think is kind of a uh, something we need to be on guard for. Um, and with respect to the modeling those costs and whether you do it top down or bottom up, I think the other issue is that uh, you still have a markup and an allocation of institutional costs beyond the direct costs for those products. And for, for especially for market dominant products, that's a challenge always because um, you know, a 200% contribution uh, or cost coverage for parcel select looks very good. Of course, first class mail letters, 300% standard mail yep. letters, you know, some of the products are, are similar, even though the overall uh, cost coverage for, for competitor products and market dominant products are, are basically the same at this point, competitor products a little bit higher. I do think on pricing, I, I couldn't agree more in terms of last mile strategy as being really the, the hard and the pulse of services kind of core strength and their structural advantage. Um, I think that, you know, Jim's going to speak to it in a minute, now wearing a PSA hat, but PSA has been beating that drum for years, I think, in part, you know, echoing, I think, Mike, many of the comments that you're making here, which is, I think mailers as stakeholders need certainty in terms of what the strategic direction is from the postal service. And, you know, pricing is a tool to drive strategy. It's, it's, the, it's probably the most prominent way that the postal service communicates with its customers. And I think they need to, mailers need to understand, is the service looking to incentivize work share? Should they be making investments uh, to present mail further downstream or not? Or is that being discouraged? And I think mailers try to structure their business around that. It's one of the reasons why I think you see kind of some of the inertia in the industry is it's hard to make those investments over long term and plan if you're getting mixed signals. Uh, I also agree with the idea of decoupling commercial and retail products. 
I think this is something also where there's been a little bit of back and forth kind of fits and starts. I think there's a, uh, a frequent attraction by some at the commission, some at the postal service uh, to say, let's try to simplify pricing. Most large sophisticated commercial mailers are less interested in kind of average prices than they are saying, let's de-average them and really try to find what's the most efficient price for the preparation uh, that, that we're taking on. And I think your comment on the, the postal service network is exactly right in terms of, you know, it, it may be that the 42% capacity in trucks is not but that could mean two things. One, it means you need to fill the trucks or it means you need fewer trucks. And I think in a world of declining, uh, secular declines in mail volume, it may be that now is a better time than most to outsource the cost and the risk of some of these upstream activities through more aggressive work sharing for the postal service. And, and the last piece that I would just touch on, and I think you know, a lot of this kind of, again, raises it is, you know, I think commercial mailers are looking at this and saying, you know, the self-funded model where, they sustain an entire system, which has always been kind of the uh, the trade-off, may be a luxury that people can no longer afford. And, you know, Kevin mentioned earlier the Postal Service's role, and it's a role they should be very proud about as a middle-class jobs engine back in the 70s and 80s. Uh, but again, that was on 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 the backs of ratepayers at a time when mail volume was growing, uh, and I think it was a different uh, market dynamic. And so then the question is, if mailers can't continue to afford to pay for this and they're not finding value if rates keep going up and there's service degradation, who else pays for it uh, and where do you look for that? And that, I think, begs the question, is the is our stakeholders in, in the postal system looking to Congress for a big enough ask in the reform bills that are pending? And, and is Congress really looking at the problem um, with appropriate perspective as well? With that, Jim, I'll turn it over to you and um, you can share your thoughts as well hey, hey vic this is this is larry i have a question okay hey, hey michael I, it was an interesting presentation i'm a little confused though can you tell me how what you've kind of described a system should look like would differ from the way we currently price standard mail i mean i kind of listen to what you said and unbundling and drop shipping and de-averaging and that seemed to me to be a lot like hey that sounds a whole lot like standard mail I, you know what, Larry? It is. And I would argue that arithmetically, there's not really a difference. But, you know, I, I, I think, you know, Mike Scanlon made some, I think, astute observations. And I think often pricing does drive strategy decisions. And I look at the last, and I'm, I'm guilty, I'm a guilty party in this. I look at the last 40 years and pricing is still very highly averaged, even in standard mail. And lots of, I think, missed opportunities. And I, I, I try to understand why that might have happened. And I do think the structural approach is a factor in impeding different ways of thinking about how to do pricing. So, for example, you could have node-based pricing uh, where your, your price for a five-digit uh, SCF standard mail letter varies by geography. And there might be good reasons for doing that, but those things haven't even been tried. And I think the structural approach to pricing is a, a, a real impediment to thinking differently and, and unlocking some different approaches that just haven't even been tried. So you'd like a little finer detail and a more flexible mindset. Well, we know the commercial mailers can handle virtually any level of complexity in pricing the Postal Service wants to throw at them. and you know, when prices are so highly averaged and when prices are so far above marginal cost uh, on standard mail letters or first class letters, there have to be opportunities for more de-averaging that could produce better results. I think we have Jim right. Cochran now um, available. Yeah, I think I got it figured out here. There he is. Can you hear me? All right. Hey, um, Thank you, Michaels. I apologize for the technology. This has been an interesting one, and I, I thought I knew Zoom pretty well, but I think there's the size of the conference changes it. Uh, you know, the the the, the presentation. I, I agree with most of the premise of it. Michael and I have talked about some of this, but you know, it's kind of interesting. Um, and we talked about the the parcel select, and and I was just looking at this recently. I've been very focused on last mile, and and. And in 2000, I found an old slide as, you know, as a, I'm an old guy, so I keep things. But in 2002, we had 8 million packages in, in the DDU. 
It was the All Airborne Express, and that was the first year that I took over the, the, the package business, the ground business, after we shut down the EPS group. And, and, uh, and it, it, honestly, that's grown to 303.5 billion packages. And uh, you know, I, I, I had a, a memory of, of a, one of my former bosses that was shutting it down, a guy named Bob Bernstock. People might remember him. Um, because he, he was didn't my think boss, it, too. Yeah, he didn't think it had the, the value proposition. And uh, but, it, you know, honestly, I, it's I think about this. Now, this is an interesting conversation because you think about this in a network. Where's the innovation and the, and the capital investment in the Postal Service in, in that period of, of automation was all in the processing centers. Right. So we put all this DBCS equipment in the processing centers. I remind people there used to be a customer service barcode sorters that was in post offices. And then we put them all back in. And, and I see Jim Sauber on and actually letter carriers were part of the people running some of those machines. And, and so we but we moved them all back into the post office. And uh, now we're fi- trying to figure out how to make the network more efficient. And, and at the same time, the future is all about the last mile. I mean, the cap, the capital investments, not postal capital investment, the investor community investments, the the uh, uh, is is all in trying to figure out last mile right now. And and. And meanwhile, we're trying to redesign a network to run from plant to plant. And, and so I, I couldn't agree more that with Mike on, the, on some of these concepts of, of, of trying to change how we do pricing. You know, it's there's I don't know how many NSAs the Postal Service has on the competitive side, but let's say it's 1,500. That's 1,500 products the way it's reviewed. Every product, every NSA is a product. And, and so fundamentally, Yet we still group so many different things on the mail side that there's never been a, like an, a, a successful practice on NSAs on the mail side. And, and, you know, so opening up the, the concepts of getting mail more into the last mile, just like we did with packages, I think is, 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 is uh, really kind of the future. I mean, it really needs to kind of move in that direction because, you know, I, I, I it, it's not going to continue the way it is. I mean, this I, I, the whole issue, I, I was never in the pricing group, but I, I managed pricing when I was chief marketing officer. And um, I just think there's a huge opportunity here to learn from. So where is all the, you know, the, if I look at the, the investor community and, and the investments that are going on in last mile, and that's not just packages and mail, it's food and everything else that everyone's trying to figure out and meanwhile, there's investments in the middle mile. The, the investments in the middle mile is just to get stuff to the last mile. There are people literally opening up buildings around the country to sort parcels just to get them to the last mile, whether that be at a post office or a UPS depot or a FedEx depot. And, you know, obviously emulating a lot of what Amazon's already done with their sort center. So, you know, I, I think that we, we have to be really, you know, I think about it from PAEA in 2006, the world's changed in the last 15 years, right? So, if I look out 15 years, I think it's all about last mile and changing. And so, I mean, one of the things in the 10 year review, they talked about investing in post offices. And I hope part of that investment is, is sortation. And, and, you know, some of these equipment that are being deployed right now, they, they say it's for packages for peak period, but they would really do a great job on bundles, these new delivery unit sorters. And there's, I think, 100 of them going up between going in between now and the end of the year. You know, once again, uh, it's, if you think about where the market is growing, you know, deliveries keep growing, but all of our innovation funds in the last you know, 20 years have mostly been spent in processing centers and maybe they've run their course. I'll, I'll throw out a, a, you know, a crazy idea, but maybe in some ways, you know, then you need to kind of micro size it a little bit. And then you do a little more of that in, in post offices around the country. And that might be, you know, controversial to say, but, you know, I, I do think that, you know, it's 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 a big challenge. Um, and I talked about the NSAs, but, you know, if, if we probably should begin by taking a look at all the market dominant products, there's a whole lot of things grouped together. And I do know some of that history, and I think they were grouped together to make it easier to cost them. But now you have like everything, you know, marketing mail is probably the, the poster child for too many things jammed together. You know, poor catalogs, you know, the, the uh, catalogs have been uh, flats have been you know, hit for being underwater, but, you know, most of the underwater nature of it comes out of the mixed generation, the real residue stuff. And, and so, you know, if you put them together with carrier out, you, you probably have something that might be more profitable. And meanwhile, they're all staring at significant bumps in price. So, you know, things need to change. I mean, we've been doing, 
you know, the pricing, the categorization of, of the male products didn't begin in PAEA. It began back in 1970, I think. I don't know. If Jeff Colvin or somebody was on, they could probably talk through some of that history. I don't, I don't know it. But it's probably time to delineate things a little more and, and then decide, you know, how much you want to really in, in, uh, incent the industry to take things deeper into the system. I, I think that the next 15 years, if, if, if we're, that we're going to be very focused on, on last mile capabilities, and that's to deliver both mail and packages and anything else that America needs. So I'll stop there for, you know, we had some other thoughts and questions from people. I, I didn't prepare a slide, but I, I really enjoyed Michael's presentation. It got me thinking about something I've been thinking about for a lot of years, which is, I think the battleground for the next 15 years is last mile. It, how well you can do last mile and deliver things. And that is not just a postal problem. It's a societal problem on, on food and medicine and everything else. So. And I, I want to circle back to some points that have been made earlier and talk about a specific public policy issue that is relevant here. Um, and it's, you know, the, the secular decline in mail volume is partly a phenomenon of technology, but framed from a different perspective, it means that uh, recipients and by extension senders value mail less than it costs to deliver it in the current environment in relative terms at least and the postal service is in a tough position it 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 because of its status and because of its you know status as a government agency and its history and its collective bargaining history it pays pretty high wages and relative to companies like UPS and FedEx that's not that much of a gap because you know UPS has a union FedEx pays its employees very well but you have new entrants in delivery markets that are you know, very small, very nimble, uh, don't pay such high wages. They might even rely exclusively on contractors that don't even get benefits. And so increasingly, the Postal Service finds itself having to compete against a whole new set of operators with very different cost structures. And I worry that uh, continued expectation that the Postal Service can handle everything from end to end will accelerate the pricing of mail out of existence if if we don't do something pretty quickly is my time up um yeah okay. the time is up Vic. Yeah, okay that's a shame that was a really good ongoing discussion there are some stuff in Q&A. I know the people who sent in those. I'll take those offline and talk to them. Well, I, uh, think, we, I think we're uh, scheduled to go to one. So we uh, yeah. we have time. So if you want to pick them up, that's OK. I apologize. I thought it was 12. No. Sorry. Um, so one of the questions about uh, establishing carrier route pre-sort for small packages, um, you know, I, as far as I'm concerned, when it comes to trying new things, the Postal Service should be trying way more stuff than it does. Uh, now, there's reasons for that. It's tough to get anything through the approval process. Uh, everything's very public. So if something doesn't work, uh, there's consequences for that. But by all means, more and better experimentation uh, on all product areas, competitive and market dominant, the more the better uh, from this perspective anyway. I mean, I think it's a challenge of, of the logistics in some ways. I mean, most of the large uh, mailers are, are running 53 foot trailers, which don't lend themselves to a small New England, you know, community. Uh, you know, it, it's been, you know, 200 year old streets in a small, you know, historic building. So, and I, I think they're a logistic challenge. It's not, it's easy for me to say everything should go to post offices, but there's a whole lot of change, but there is a whole lot of investment in that, in moving stuff. And it's not just postal vehicles. And UPS and FedEx vehicles riding down the streets, Amazon, Target, everybody's riding down the streets now. I, I, I would argue that there's more LTL trucks running into communities that people buy bigger things, white glove service, I'll call it. Um, and there's startups that are just trying to help do some of that local delivery. So, you know, couriers, regional carriers, there's a whole lot of people in that space. So, you know, I, I do think it's going to evolve. And I think there's a lot of... Um, 
venture capital money going into that space. You know, if you're if you're a delivery company, you, you can usually get some funding. And so if, if that's the trend, where's the postal service going to be? And where's this industry going to be versus that trend? And I would argue that one might be should be a little more strategic about how you how you uh, enter mail and where you enter mail and, and the postal service should think that way also. But meanwhile, as we talked about, we have a guy trying to, you know, a postmaster general, I'm being respectful, trying to rebuild a national network that maybe you won't need in seven years. I don't know. Okay, if there are no other questions, uh, thanks very much, uh, Jim and, uh, and Michael. Thank and, you, Victor. Uh, great job, it was really great. Okay, so let's move on to uh, Dave Williams. Thanks very much. My topic is pre-funding and, and I've titled the presentation, The Game of Loans. It's a nearly half trillion a year um, tale. We've got uh, fools and knaves and bad theater uh, driving forward the entire horrific story. It'd probably be good to start in 2002. GAO inexplicably concludes that the Postal Pension Fund is underfunded and orders OPM to figure out what the new price should be and how to charge more. Um, so the first audit ever occurs, the first comprehensive audit, uh, GAO was wrong and OPM was wrong. We were overfunded. We'd been overbilled at the Postal Service. Um, the pension fund was full and there was a lot left over. Um, so the Postal Service was due a refund. That's certainly what would happen at the bank. Uh, the payments were reduced for the pension fund but an escrow account was built for the enormous amount that was left over. Uh, the escrow account, unfortunately, was not a lockbox. It was filled with IOUs from the Treasury. Um, the Treasury announced that a refund of the money would be very painful for them, that they had spent it. So two problems. The money was not going to be refunded and the money could not be invested in a retirement fund. It had to remain loaned to the treasury at a disastrously low rate of return. Uh, Congress didn't know what to do with the escrow fund, so they just said, we'll include it in the next legislation. Uh, I think we all recall that the next legislation came four long unending years later. Uh, it was a time of inaction unending debates, trying to convert simple math problems into political debates and one-upmanship. Um, the bill title, Postal Accountability Enhancement Act, as all bills, was a very good hint as to what the bill was not going to do. It would, for instance, PAEA was passed to assure that the postal retirement liability would never fall on the shoulders of the taxpayers. The moment the bill was signed, the entire liability fell onto the shoulder of taxpayers because the treasury borrowed and spent it all. And the taxpayers now are in debt to the postal service for um, over 300 billion. What PIA did do, it, it finally was of course passed. What PIA is going to do is force the postal service to cut his workforce that was intended, but they had the cut go on continuously until the next reform bill. Um, the plot spoiler here is that Congress can't pass the next reform bill. And so the cuts seemingly now go on forever. It halted all price increases forever, just, in just, just inflation increases. And for inflation, they used the CPI instead of the ECI, as was pointed out most uh, of po the Postal Service's costs are involved with labor, which is the ECI, not the, the basket of um, commodities, which is the CPI. They were also ordered to keep all service standards and infrastructure, uh, which 
cut off the, even in the face of financial ruin, that cut off any chance of, um, of adjusting and fixing and adapting to the new world. And it divided pricing in a monopoly and competitive areas at the, at the request of the um, private express carriers. It devoured the new escrow fund, no refund, and you could not invest the money wisely. Uh, and it said you now owe a new bill for healthcare prefunding. Uh, weirdly, the, because the government doesn't prefund healthcare, it does a pay go. Part of the reason is you can't project health liabilities into the future reliably. There'll be new diseases, new cures, longer life expectancies. So uh, it didn't make sense. It, you'll see that, of course, it makes sense later. It also requires pension fund contributions forever. Jen Bradley did some very interesting work at the GAO that showed that the return on the treasury loans was never gonna be enough to pay the, the um, pension and health fund annual debts. Um, so like the pension fund, the new health fund could not invest in the normal way. Uh, it, it also is a requirement that the bill not score against the US budget. So uh, crippling payments of $5 billion were gonna be necessary to make scoring go away. It's a little weird since Congress had placed the Postal Service off budget. And it didn't seem to make a lot of sense that scoring would, would be relevant in this world. Lastly, it required the PRC to conduct a 10 year study to fix anything that was, if the trolley had gone off the tracks, uh, that was the chance to fix it. So Congress, very embarrassed, they'd gone on forever. And like all bills, it was passed, it, it was written, crafted two in the morning by 22 year olds drinking cold coffee with cigarette butts floating around in it. And it ended up an orphan bill. No one wanted to claim that they had anything to do with, with the bill, especially pre-funding. Henry Waxman finally passed away and uh, there became efforts to blame the whole thing on him. The bill was primarily in response to donor, political donor requests. The Postal Service had almost no input, input into it at all. Um, so let's move on to how the bill performed. It didn't, it didn't go well. UPS pricing was based on, crafted carefully for break-even um, economics. Don't make a penny, don't lose a penny. And now they were told, pay $5 billion a year. There wasn't a penny to pay the $5 billion a year by design. Infrastructure and prices, as I said, were frozen. So you can't do cost cutting. Um, sealing the fate of the Postal Service with regard to this. In addition to modernization, the Postal Service was trying to grapple with some very serious corporate issues. The economic downturn, digital diversion, and the growing adoption of the internet by, um, by commercial and commercial correspondence. The prefunds, of course, are now in all um, treasury notes and the over the next couple of years, the pension fund lost $30 billion. Again, by design, anyone would have seen that that was going to happen and it did. And, and we're, they remained on the unending crash diet of staff cuts until performance began to suffer. Uh, again, obvious, inevitable, and it happened. The next place to touch down is 2016. Here's our chance to fix the bill the PRC did not issue its report and would not issue it for, for years to come. What the PRC did do is um, give the Postal Service a, a badly needed, needed exigent increase, but then it was taken back away to be, uh, that created a $2 billion a year operational loss to the penny what, uh, what was provided in the, with the exigent increase. Um, in the PRC's defense, the Postal Service may not have provided uh, the evidence 
that would have permitted them to um, enable the exigent case to go on that part of the debate that that uh, goes on. Um, trying to race through here to make up a little time. Congress obviously realizes that you need a new bill. It's been many years. They're no longer functioning at a normal level and they can't they can't do the bill, they can't do appropriations, they can't do oversight. They, it's a, a collapsing organization and the Postal Service is caught in it. The Treasury rides to the rescue and demands that they be allowed to run the Postal Service because we owed them $15 billion. They were a little silent on the fact that they owed us $330 billion and had said that they were not competent enough to repay that or provide it back after having taken it. So Congress and the White House reached the normal conclusion we need more politicians in the program. Um, let's pause a moment and do some math. OPM had wrongfully estimated the liability for pension and he retiree health at 400 billion. That's probably a hundred, it's $111 billion more than the actual liability was. Um, the G, the, both the PRC and the IG did the math for the actual liability and realized that OPM had transferred a lot of their debt to the postal bill. Uh, GAO validated the math on this, but they said that in the end, once you buy a stamp or once you contribute to your pension, that now belongs to them. And they could do anything they want, including the really popular option of doing nothing. So the, the problem continued to drive in the straight line. So the UPS has, um, at, at creation, had about $330 billion for what appears to be a $200 billion plus liability. Had it been invested at that, well, so in other words, they were overfunded at creation. But still, uh, had it been invested, even in the government's own TSP, it would have been fully funded two years ago, even at the exaggerated rate. Um, pensions are going up, but pension costs annually are going up. They were about $11 billion. So even at creation, the treasury return on investment was about $6 billion, not enough. We're not adding to the fund, we're killing the fund. TSP, had it been placed there, would have created about $26 billion a year, enough to pay the costs, even, even with the ups and downs of harder times. Uh, Congress also put this in the hands of OPM to manage. We should talk about that for a moment in closing. Um, OPM was assigned to manage this all. Uh, they had an unbroken record of failure with all of the retirement funds a very odd selection. They were in charge of making the liability estimate, uh, estimation, despite their early attempts to raid the fund, they probably should have been the last one to be given that assignment. And they would determine their own liability, even though they had a, a conflict of interest. What you've got is a dishonest student being handed his own paper to grade. And you can imagine what happened. The first thing was they tried to shift 27 billion uh, of, the, uh, of the fund over to the military pension. Um, Congress made them put it back. The next thing they did is what I've been alluding to here. Um, they, did, they determined how much they owed and how much the Postal Service owed as its share. OPM owes something because while the Postal Service was a department, they collected payments from the Postal Service and employees all those years. And so now it was, they were responsible for those years in, in imagining who was going to handle what part of the liability. OPM used two different standards to compute the bill. Pretty unbelievable. For their own, they assumed that future costs would never go up. For the Postal Service, they assumed the post the future costs would go up radically. That resulted in $111 billion of the OPM's share being transferred 
to the Postal Service and the liability climbing through the ceiling. They also determined that at the moment that the Postal Service went out of business, which is what the paella was all about, all, all postal employees would be eligible for a retirement. That is not true of any department, not true of the Postal Service. A huge percentage will be ineligible for the full and ineligible for even a partial amount. And yet the, the uh, liability was inflated. OPM failed to, and the Postal Service was at fault here too, they failed to assign any value to UPS property, which would have represented a huge asset to throw against the liability if the Postal Service collapsed as Congress uh, assumed. So let me wind it up. Had OPM paid their share, we would have been pre-funded at creation, or we would have continued to have been overfunded. Had OPM based the liability on vested eligibility, we also would have been pre-funded at creation, even at the inflated estimate. Had OPM computed the property assets, we would have been overfunded and may still be. Had the escrow fund been invested in retirement funds instead of lent to the treasury, again, we would have been over, we would have begun to have been overfunded a couple of years ago. So what should happen? A decision needs to be made. Would you like to have a pension fund and, and would you like to send this back to OPM with all with the proper contributions that any department would have made? And, and uh, in this experiment, or would you like to give us our money so that it could be invested properly and it's still not too late to save the fund? Um, in action, no action, which may be very popular, uh, probably a death spiral in mail costs. It'll unleash huge parcel price increases. And it'll be unlikely that the OPM uh, restates their share of the, the bill, nor will we identify property as assets. Um, so three choices return it to the OPM, to create an actual retirement fund as you claim you have, three, do nothing with very severe consequences. Inaction, we can't seem to get through to anybody, but inaction is a decision and very severe consequences. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop a little bit early so that we can get a bit back on our schedule. And I turn it over to uh, capable hands of Larry Buck, and is marrying me. Thank you, Dave. I'd like to introduce our two discussants. We're going to have Ken John, who is currently the president of Postal Policy Associates. And then we're going to have Jim Sauber, who is the chief of staff at the NALC. I'm just going to say one minute worth of things to take a little bit of pressure off of them, which is why I, while I don't necessarily agree with every single aspect of Dave's recounting of the history. I think there's a lot of room for interpretation. And I want to say that because I do want to take pressure off from the discussants. I think his overall, uh, his overall finding, which is that, hey, the Postal Service has a pretty big uh, retirement fund, and maybe in the future, they ought to be able to invest it in a way that would actually obviate some of the need for VIX Universal Service Fund is, is a good one. And maybe the Postal Service does deserve a little true up for what it's lost over the years. So having said that, uh, which is kind of an, an overarching view, let me first turn to Ken John, who will talk about whatever he wants to talk about for seven or eight or nine minutes, then to Jim Sauber, and then we'll entertain questions. Thanks. Ken, take it away. Unmute. Ken, take it away. All right, maybe we should let Jim go first if Jim is ready to take it away. Jim Sauber, are you ready? Sure, hi, Larry. Go ahead. Good afternoon, everybody. I've been on Zoom now since 6 a.m. this morning, so <laughs> I'm probably gonna 
tie a personal best by the end of the day. So I'll try to be coherent here. I, we did a global meeting with, uh, we belong to a global federation of unions. We had our annual, our, our quadrennial meeting virtually. And imagine what that's like with trying to time something to get everybody in every time zone on all at the same time. So anyway, if I'm incoherent, I have an excuse. <laughs> Um, so I, I, you know, I, Dave's presentation, very interesting. It's kind of a painful history for all of us who went through the whole PAE exercise. Um, you know, that bill had sort of some, we, we, we went into it with our eyes wide open. That bill had sort of three guardrails in our mind uh, that were built in and all of them kind of came up short in the end. Uh, one was the, obviously the uh, exigent increase um, uh, provision. Uh, Dave mentioned that. I largely agree with his his analysis of that. Um, we also had this this issue of trying to get our pension allocations right. Uh, I, I totally agree with Dave that OPM is not has never been an honest broker in this exercise. It's not particularly well suited to run a pension fund, and it has built in incentives uh, to minimize its own cost that it's, a, it's a responsible for, which is the taxpayer side of the pension funds, uh, has always had an incentive to uh, not treat the Postal Service fairly, and they've generally done that um, over and over and over again. Um, but there was a, a guardrail in the PAEA. The PRC was to investigate, issue a report, and as Senator Collins and Senator Carper indicated, they gave the OPM the authority to change the way they allocate pension, to um, give the Postal Service a fairer allocation of the pension assets. Um, and uh, basically, o OPM convinced the Obama administration that the law didn't say what the law said, which is they had the authority to make these changes. And they, they insisted they didn't have the authority. Uh, they, I know the GAO did a report saying all these different methods have, have, have uh, uh, are reasonable methods that could be used. Uh, it's just basically a public policy decision. The fight was who should make that decision. And OPM insisted that the Congress had to legislate to inform, them, to make them do that. So that was a that was another guardrail that, that just didn't didn't uh, uh, work at the time. So we are we are where we are now. Um, I think. Um, if you, I, I don't know if you, any of you have ever seen the reports that OPM puts out to the Postal Service on their pension and retiree health fund. It is, it is absolutely shocking what, what little transparency there is. The Postal Service gets a two or three page or a four or five page document on the Postal Retiree Health Benefits Fund every year. There's not a single name on it. There's not even a logo of the of the of the uh, of the division of OPM that puts it together. There are no names. There are no numbers. There they don't follow any actuarial professional standards of practice, and they just present the Postal Service with their estimates of their liabilities and gives them their costs. It would you know I, I'm on the trustee. I'm a board of trustees for my union's pension fund. If we produce documents like that, we would be a, we'd be subject to fine by the DOL um, for violating our fiduciary responsibility because it's just an unacceptable practice. They just hand these costs over the Postal Service, then you know, puts it into their spreadsheets and reports it as, as net losses. So uh, there's a lot of lack of trust and transparency in OPM, and that's something that really has to be addressed. Uh, I think we're going to, this, this bill that's before Congress now will, is, is a fairly, fairly narrow bill. It's really designed to, to look at just trying to straighten out the balance sheet somewhat. Uh, it's very limited, but we need to do more. It does, it does address one of the issues Dave talked about, which is that the Postal Service should be reporting its vested liability, just like other companies do uh, under GAAP accounting standards. Uh, that would be included in this bill. Um, but we're right. Ultimately, in the end, we're going to have to have a, a, a major reform of uh, how we invest our retirement funds. You know, this $330 billion in, in bonds, we're, we're earning these the last few years under 2%. They're supposed to fund benefits that are, uh, that are growing by 5 to 7% a year when it comes to health healthcare costs. Uh, just it's a, like Dave mentioned, it was designed to fail. The unfunded liability was designed by design to grow forever. Um, 
And so at least on the retiree health side, that's a no brainer. We should be investing those, those funds uh, more smartly. But the same thing could be said uh, on the pension funds. Uh, we did an analysis going back to 1990. If we had just invested in you know broad index funds of the, of the sort uh, that the thrift savings plan offers, um, we'd have basically doubled the assets of what we have right now. Uh, we've, we've had $300 billion in foregone earnings as a result of this investment policy. So I think it's going to be very difficult to, to change that given the way the you know, Congressional Budget Office works and the scoring rules and the PAYGO statute. Um, you know, they're not going to transfer $300 billion to the Postal Service and say, go out there and find an investment advisor to invest it. That's just not going to happen. So what we think we should do is just try to go start build going forward under a new legislation, not the one that's before Congress now, but we need a, a provision that will allow us to stop putting money into these you know, treasury bond only funds. We should set up an investment trust on the Postal Service, apply the private sector fiduciary standards laws to it, uh, subject to all the transparency uh, that we don't get from the OPM and invest this funds going forward. So the post service uh, typically puts about $5 billion a year into the federal employees retirement system. Under this new law, if it goes through, they'll be putting a little over a billion dollars a year into the retiree health fund. Instead of putting making those transfers into those funds, we should keep it in, a, in this new investment trust and start investing it wisely. That fund would grow very quickly over, over a 10 year period. It would easily get to 75, 80, 90 billion dollars. That those funds would be available to pay for the benefits that the, the employees have, have earned under the law. And we can gradually over time improve the funding balance uh, both for our pension funds and, and the retiree health fund. We can make that retiree health fund last a lot longer if we invest it this way going forward. So I'll, I, I, I think there's a, a huge need for reform in this area. Um, there's a lot of resistance uh, in, uh, in Congress. Um, on the Democratic side, they worry that this is a, a, a you know, sort of a, a test run for privatizing Social Security. On the Republican side, there's this notion we can't trust the Postal Service to invest this money or that somehow it's socialism if we're controlling this big batch of capital. Um, but um, I think it's a more modest proposal like the one I talked about has, has a real chance to, to move forward. And we hope to work on that should we ever get this first postal bill through. I'll stop there. Thanks, Jim. Ken John, are you now able to uh, get on the screen? We'd love to hear you. Uh, can you hear and see me? Can so, hear and see you. Thanks. So first, I I actually was on this, but um, like Kevin Kozar and some of the others uh, had difficulty with uh, signing on uh, in a way people could recognize me. So sorry about that. I did get special dispensation for the tie. Uh, having said that, uh, I would like to thank Victor and David for hosting this important conference and Larry for his work in organizing and moderating the panel. It's a pleasure being here and being able to participate. And because my expertise relates primarily on the retiree health benefits side, that's where my remarks will go. Um, I will have some common ground on this investment to jump to the end uh, where I'm going. But uh, before I get there, uh, as David has noted, uh, funding these Postal retiree health benefits is central to postal reform. So let me give a little bit of background. Uh, right now, nearly half a million postal retirees and their survivors receive postal retiree health benefits. And as has been noted, the 2006 Postal Accountability and Enhancement Act, which was introduced in the House by Representative Tom Davis and co-sponsored by Representatives Danny Davis, Henry Waxman, and John McHugh, who I did work briefly for in the late 1990s, uh, all lawmakers with long-standing interest and expertise in postal uh, issues uh, did require the Postal Service to fully prefund its postal retiree health benefits. Now, fully prefunding postal pension benefits had already long been required by law, so this was not a new concept. Prefunding the large 
post-retirement benefits of the Postal Service has been tough as first-class mail volume has declined, but it continues to make sense in my view. Setting aside sufficient funds before retirees, before employees retire, excuse me, make their benefits less vulnerable to cuts. So the idea behind the pre-funding requirement is the same as the idea behind pre-funding postal pension benefits. To set aside enough money to honor commitments to current postal employees and ensure there will be enough money to cover their health benefits when they retire. But unfortunately, as David has noted, pre-funding postal retiree health benefits really hasn't worked out so well. The 2006 Act did establish the Postal Service Retiree Health Benefits Fund and gave it $20 billion as a jumpstart. The Postal Service then made $18 billion in required prefunding payments through 2010, but since then has defaulted on all of its prefunding payments. Unfortunately, the fund's expenses are greater than its income. And in fiscal 2020, for example, the fund's expenses were $3.9 billion, while its income from U.S. Treasury securities, where the fund's assets are invested, were only $1.1 billion, not nearly enough to keep up. So OPM has projected that the Retiree Health Benefits Fund will be exhausted in 2030 if the Postal Service makes no further payments. And if the fund is depleted, the Postal Service will be required under current law to cover its share of retiree health premiums on a pay-as-you-go basis. And that's just unlikely to happen under the current law and status quo, considering the amount of money involved and the Postal Service's financial condition and outlook. It's reasonable to assume Congress would step in and provide enough money to avoid benefit cuts if the fund is depleted and if the Postal Service then defaults on its pay-as-you-go payments. But there's no guarantee. And Congress does face many competing demands, including, I should note, the possibility of having to bail out Medicare and Social Security funds that also are projected to be depleted. And it's also worth noting that state governments and many private companies have already cut their retiree health benefits to control costs. So as GAO and others have recommended, Congress does need to put post-retiree health benefits on a more sustainable financial footing. Recent developments, from my perspective, are encouraging in this regard with bipartisan support for bills that would integrate these benefits with Medicare for future postal retirees. That would shift significant costs to Medicare and reduce the burden on the Retiree Health Benefits Fund by an estimated $46 billion over 10 years. So the bills there, the Postal Service Reform Act of 2021, HR 3076 and S 1720, and they acknowledge the current reality. The Postal Service doesn't have the money to support the worthy goal of pre-funding post-retiree health benefits. Both bills end the pre-funding requirement and cancel the $52 billion in past pre-funding defaults on these benefits. And I acknowledge there would be some good coming out of this. Uh, that would increase the Postal Service net income and improve its balance sheet. And as a practical matter, the Postal Service just isn't gonna be making any payments for post-retiree health benefits for the foreseeable future, much less repaying its past defaults. In addition, refund, resolving this pre-funding issue will help stakeholders focus on other difficult postal issues such as improving service, addressing rising personnel needs, replacing the vehicle fleet and crumbling infrastructure, and just making sure the Postal Service doesn't run out of the funds necessary to operate on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, like David, I do favor loosening the requirement that all funds set aside for postal retiree health benefits be invested solely in low-yielding treasuries and allowing a more robust federal thrift savings plan, TSP style investment policy. However, as noted, this requirement's been hard to change. Treasury is strongly opposed to change and it does protect the fund from the risks and volatility of the market. However, the long-term rate of return would be much greater and if invested broadly and in a diversified manner, carry manageable risk. Thanks again, and I'm happy to answer any questions and hopefully this is 
uh, contributed to a lively discussion, which we always enjoy having on this topic. Thank, thanks, Ken. Thank you very much. I'd just like to say, uh, before I, we start getting questions or people want to grill Dave Williams or the audience wants to talk, I think I, I love to pull the two threads together, the Vic thread and the Dave Williams thread, because they're really two different sides of the same coin. Vic talks about the need for a universal service fund. And why might there be a need? Well, if you go back to basic welfare economics, we all know that goods should sell if you want to have an efficient society at their marginal cost or their incremental cost. We also know that because the postal service is an increasing returns to scale or scope industry, if you price at marginal cost, you lose a whole lot of money because the marginal costs don't cover the total cost. And so the Postal Service is currently in a world where they more than cover with their current prices, the marginal costs or the incremental costs. They way more than cover those. And that means that somehow you either have to mark up above marginal costs more than we do now under the current system, or you have to reduce the marginal costs or the, or the total costs. You have to reduce the total cost. But as Dave Williams pointed out, thrown in those total costs is an enormous amount of money for stuff that arguably the Postal Service has been euchred out of to uh, come up with a, a word that I like. And so if you kind of think about the world that way, well, how do you cover the shortfall and how do you make the world a little bit more efficient and how do you restore some equity to the world? Uh, I know that Jim Sauber doesn't want to raise the topic of give the Postal Service its $300 million. But for anybody who doesn't know the joke, I just make policy, I don't implement it. Call me up and I'll send you the, uh, the, the that that joke and you'll have the whole joke. But this is a case where I don't make where I don't implement policy. I just make it. And the right economic answer is to give them the whole three hundred million dollars and let them invest it and stop arguing about universal service funds. Three hundred million dollars and another five percent is fifteen billion a year. And if you give them a little of the money that they were uh, taken advantage of in the past. It's a long, long way to go. So you can not only price closer to incremental cost and marginal cost, but you've ended any silliness. I mean, it really is the case that I've been saying for years, we, the government doesn't subsidize the Postal Service, the Postal Service subsidizes the government. So having put those two things together, uh, people can ask questions of anybody that they want to ask questions of. Uh, Dave Williams, Ken John, Jim Sauber. It's also interesting, again, to note that while if you really wanted to have some fun, you could get David and Ken John to talk about the laws and the histories, and they probably wouldn't be highly convergent, but they do get to the same solutions, which I find interesting. So having said all that, let me turn everybody loose and let's go at it. Do we have questions? I have a question for either Jim or Ken. Um, so, and this gets to, um, the point about the investment of the Postal Service's retirement funds. You guys have a lot of experience on the Hill. If the pending legislation passes, are you worried that that will just be Congress saying, okay, we've, we've done our duty and a further look at a better investment plan for those assets is just not even a thought anymore? Well, I'm happy to go first on that. Um, I, I'm not really worried about that. I mean, we this has been an argument in our community for the last 15 years. You know, we we've tried these big, massive, comprehensive bills that are you know uh, you know several hundred pages long, and everybody's got their two cents in, and every you know interest group, including my our our interest group, are pushing their agenda, and we have these big, gigantic bills, and we haven't been able to move them at all, and so. Um, we sort of concluded a few years ago that that really trying to narrow in and trying to do this in pieces is gonna, is gonna be the better approach. And it was pretty encouraging that when the Senate inter introduced this bill, they had 20 co-sponsors, 10 from each party. So that is a sign to me that that's the right strategy right now. Um, that said, we have been you know talking to uh, the congressional staff and, and, and members of Congress about this investment thing now for a good four or five years. And there's, there's a lot more comfort level now than we, when we first started talking about it. I and mean, especially there, uh, this no notion of the volatility of the market and how, how um, you know, uh, that could be a dangerous kind of thing. So we, we are, I always bring up the fact that the, the 
you know, the retiree health fund, if you just go back to the beginning and invest it in the TSP as a test case of how to survive volatility. I mean, the market crashed in 2009, 8, 2009. And despite that crash, at this point, we'd have 12 or $14 billion more now than what we actually have. Um, and so I think it has, there, it, it's sort of been t stress test in real life uh, over the last uh, uh, a few years. So I, I think that there, that our hope is to have a hearing on this issue this year uh, to talk about the, the investment policy. And then, uh, in, you know, maybe a, I think there's a lot of, we've got a lot of support from Republicans on this specific idea of investing better. Um, and I think that the real, the real test is going to be to convince the Democrats to do it. Um, uh, but there's a lot more skepticism about, you know, how this is going to just turn a big pot of money over Wall Street and is it gambling with the, uh, with the members, um, you know, future. And I, I just always point out too, that there, the fact is the law requires, un, under federal law, these retiree health benefits are entitlements. They, they apply to everybody, all every federal agency, including the Postal Service. No other, other federal agency outside a, a bit in the Pentagon are, are pre-funding these, these benefits. If our retiree health fund goes bust, it is our position that won't surprise anybody, given that you know I work for the letter carriers union. Um, it's our position that the that the taxpayers will have to pay those benefits, just like they pay them for tre retired treasury employees and retired commerce department employees and anybody else. So that that particular issue, I don't think, is relevant. But that said, I think the the data is overwhelmingly positive. The long term rate of return uh, on uh, a, a well diversified portfolio of stocks and bonds. You know, if we looked at going back to 1990, the average rate of return was 8.3%. And what we actually got was half that, less than half that. So uh, I think it's clearly the right policy and it's the next item to take up after we get through this round of, of postal reform, hopefully. And Thank I'd you. like to express some common ground here because these big comprehensive bills really have been very difficult. And I think there is some recognition about what this particular bill does and doesn't do. It's no criticism of the bill to say that it, in effect, won't do a whole lot to improve the cash flow of the Postal Service. The Postal Service hasn't been paying a cent for post retiree health benefits for years. And yet, uh, in the Medicare integration, if you're willing to you know, make that policy call, that will help prolong the life of the fund because Eliminating these pre-funding payments, which they aren't making anyway, what that means is there no longer is any authorization by law for the fund to receive any inflows except through its uh, interest on treasuries. And I think there is a lot of recognition that that's just not going to be enough. And we don't want to get to the point where the fund is depleted if the Postal Service can't make these pay-as-you-go payments and Congress has to act. Uh, so that would be very challenging. Uh, for the Congress, we certainly don't want to see any disruption. We all have common ground. We would like to see benefit security for these investments. Let's see, we seem to have some Q's and A's. David, you've got a question in there. Can you read the Q and A? about the future of the Board of Governors, assuming the newly appointed governors are confirmed, what do you see as the likely priorities for a reshuffled Board of Governors? I would bet you're not gonna, well, if you wanna talk about that one, go ahead. If you don't, say it's outside of the scope of this. <laughs> hmm. um, if I understand the question, it, it, it's uh, looking at what the actions going forward of the Board of Governors will be once everyone is named. Um, well, certainly the priorities are going to be um, this, the pre-funding, um, and I hope taking center stage or the operational matters, uh, restoring, don't accept today's performance as the best we can do. Try to recover um, more normal performance in the processing and delivery of mail. And then if you need to set a new standard, it's more understandable. I, I really don't understand how you can 
say um, that the, we have decided to remain collapsed. So the, they probably need to revisit that. They, I'll be clearly the PRC has given them tremendous overhead, uh, uh, headroom to raise prices. I think there needs to be some discussion of the negative impacts, not just the elasticity, but but a lot of branding kinds of issues. If they take full advantage of that entire increase, they need to take as little as possible to uh, to to uh, right the ship as far as normal operational matters. So, so uh, Dave Williams, we're going to get a rate case filing. We think tomorrow afternoon. I, for one, am willing to bet that they'll use almost all the authority they have. Would you bet that they will, or would you bet that they won't, even though we've heard you think what was wise? I would bet that they will. <laughs> okay, <laughs> fair enough. We have a fairly uh, sophisticated or intricate question from Bob Fisher on finances. Bob, why don't you throw it out there and see whether Dave Williams can answer it? whether Jim Sauber can answer it. We often tell people don't ask us, ask Jim Sauber because he's forgotten more than we know or whether Ken John can answer it. So Bob, if you want to try to propound your question, maybe one of the three panelists can do this on the fly, which I think is pretty hard, but go ahead. Can Bob unmute? I'm not sure he can. Uh, yeah, he may not be able to. I'm, uh, can we unmute him? Because I'm afraid that I'm going to butcher it in reading it. I mean, uh, I can read is, it, but- This is Bob Fisher. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Hi, Bob. I think I, I think I, I think I'm unmuted now. Yep. Okay. okay. So uh, I'll I'll read it or I'll I'll try to. <laughs> you know, by my estimate, you know, the proposed legislation will dramatically change the net income results. You know, for this year, you know, on the estimates that I do, it you know, net income would become two billion dollars uh, because the the three point nine billion wouldn't hit the balance sheet. You know, as as uh, I think. Um, it was pointed out that there, there would become a billion just for the, the readjustment process. Um, so in effect, the legislation um, exclusive of the, the non-cash workers comp dramatically changes the, uh, the finances and the, 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 the results. And in my mind, that drives uh, a lot of dysfunction in decisions. Um, uh, you know, especially I think, you know, towards the rate, the rate increase pending tomorrow was really trying to fix, you know, some of the problems that are addressed in the, the legislation. So I guess I wanted to um, see if anyone had any comments on that aspect of it as to how the whole proposed legislation and the health funding process, uh, funding process is really related to the poor annual performance that's reported. Any panelists want to try to or just want to take that on the fly or Dave Williams? I, I guess I would want to say this. It's great to hear from you, Bob. I haven't seen you in a while. The, um, I do think that the pre-funding disaster, this mess, is preventing anybody from seeing the real operational problems that are much smaller. I can tell you that if, Larry, that if I owed you $100, I would break my neck to pay it. If I owed you $5 billion, I wouldn't give you a cent. <laughs> and I think that's exact. It, it became so insane that anybody with any judgment dropped out. And um, so I, the first thing we need to do, I think, is clear that away. We do need operations to uh, improve. And then I, I think if, if there remains a loss, uh, it's unclear to me that, that there is gonna be an operational loss any longer. Deal with that. I, it's it's uh, impossible to look at the problem we have with pre-funding and without pre-funding in a commingled way. You've got to, <laughs> if pre-funding disappears, I think there could be a very vigorous attack on the relatively small problem that remains. The liability will just melt away. It was pretty much manufactured um, in the first place. As, as far as how much is being lost every year, you're commingling co co mingling losses with failure to save for the future. And uh, if that doesn't have everybody confused, I'm not sure what would. 
and Jim and Ken, I'm betting that you guys actually crunch the numbers that way each year just to know what they are, but the wider community never thinks of it that way. Yeah, I mean, I would just say, I think the impact of this particular bill on the net income will be fairly modest, um, but I do think that it will have the strong uh, improvement in the balance sheet. And I, and I would just note that these, these, um, these long-term li estimates of the liability are so inflated um, it's really sensitive to interest rates and we're in a, a historically low interest rate environment. Uh, and uh, just, it, it's very difficult to estimate these liabilities. It's a 92 year calculation from OPM. They, 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 I had uh, one of their actuaries that once describe it to me. And so with very modest changes in interest rates, you have huge swings in, the, in these projected balances. And we really do think they should follow private sector reporting practice uh, like they do on all their other accounting and they should report their vested liability. And that's what they, that's what should concern public policymakers. What happens if the postal service were to stop operations? You know, that's the, that's the relevant issue uh, for, you know, what, what the taxpayers would be on the, on the hook for, because really only the people who are within five years of retirement, only those active people are, are entitled to uh, retiree health insurance under the law. So I think just getting the balance sheet, get a more, a more honest look at this, and uh, it'll have a modest improvement on net income. Um, but most of the work's gonna have to be done internally. It's gonna have to be done what we've been doing really over the last 15 years in several rounds of bargaining. We've dramatically reduced labor costs. We've adjusted to lower volume, and that's not gonna change. No, no, you know, I think, Getting obviously getting an investment bill would have a very positive impact. Our, our pension funds are very well funded, despite the insane investment policy we have. We're uh, the FERS and CSRS pension funds and the Postal Service would be considered green zone pensions in the under the Pension Protection Act, despite the fact that we're forced to only earn two two and a half three percent on our our pension investments. So if we got the pension, if we started investing our, our retirement funds better, that would have additional improvements on net income and an additional improvements on, on the balance sheet. Um, but that's, that's still going back to our earlier conversations, the earlier discussions, getting the operations right, getting our pricing right, um, creating incentives to grow. That's really the, the key to the long-term survival of the Postal Service. So let me let me just ask one question, Ken, before I turn to you. So, Jim, you're saying that you think this bill would hit the balance sheet more than the income statement. I think so. Yes. And that's kind of what the CARES Act stuff did, as I understand that the CARES Act just hit the balance sheet. The, mm -hmm. the loan, quote, forgive loan never winds up in the income statement. It just winds up on the balance sheet. Yeah. Right. There, you know, there are there are administrative options that we're hoping the Biden administration will take. Um, with, um, with, you know, they can do administratively to require OPM to give us a fairer shake on the allocation of pension benefits. If they did that, we'd be, that would save another billion dollars a year uh, for the Postal Service because they would have a fully funded CSRS and all of, under the current law, any surplus in the CSRS in the year 2025 goes into the retiree health fund. So that would make that, that fund last a lot longer too. So there's a, it's going to take a lot of work. It's going to take work at the collective bargaining table, at the PRC to get pricing right and, and operationally for us to really thrive. But we just got to do it step by step. Thanks. Ken, you, I cut you off. I'm sorry. Oh, it's all right. Um, look, uh, I'll answer some of the financial technical part, hopefully in a way that makes sense to people. Uh, uh, Jim Sauber is right. It would improve the balance sheet. Why? Because every missed pension payment under the financial reporting rules, which are the SEC reporting rules, uh, which the Postal Service is subject to by law, well, that counts as an expense. So what happens is it turns into a big IOU, uh, just like any other expense that's expected to be paid just a little bit later, only it never gets paid. So you have $52 billion in, in past pre-funding defaults uh, sitting out there on OPM's balance sheet. Well, in their most recent annual financial report, they basically called it a bad debt, and that's their words. They, they had to report under financial reporting standards that it's unlikely that they'll ever collect it. And yet, 
that still sits on the Postal Service balance sheet. It still sits on OPM's balance sheet. Uh, separate of this, however, there's the matter of having enough cash to maintain the Postal Service uh, under the financial pressures it's in. And that's a, you know, that's a different and difficult problem. And we all know the Postal Service has projected that under the status quo, it will uh, run out of money. We've heard these projections before, but nonetheless, uh, the Postal Service does have a lot of information on its financial trends and they do deserve to be taken seriously. So there are a lot of, there are a lot of needs, including postal infrastructure out there. Thank you. We have more questions. Uh, if this is Bob again, if I could, could just follow up to, you know, I understand the impact, the difference between the impact and the balance sheet versus the income statement. But if they have a $3.9 billion charge on the income statement that they don't pay, and so and that's going to become a billion dollars, you know, that's 2.9 billion in expenses that don't get balanced against revenue. And I think that's the point that I, I'm trying to make. And then if you throw in the other non-controllable expenses, especially non, you know, the non-cash workers comp adjustment, you know, the, my projections show a, a completely different picture than what's, you know, out there in the, you know, in the community of looking at postal results. And I might have it wrong. I'm happy to talk to people about what my, what I show, but uh, that's the point I wanted to make. No, right. and that, Bob, you're absolutely right. The, the, the fact that the normal cost for retiree health will not be an expense anymore should this bill pass. That's that's true. It's that that's the that'll be the effect on the net income because that gets recorded as an expense. It's a that's a, and right now the Postal Service uses that. That's a that's under their reporting. It's considered a controllable expense, um, and so that will disappear. So you're absolutely right about that. Yeah, and I think the APW correctly pointed out in one of the congressional hearings that. You know their paper losses, and it it looks far different when you don't consider the paper losses. And I think that that whole component is missing in the uh, issues. And I I personally think that it's driving really bad operational and and ten year plan decisions by DeJoy that wouldn't be made when you looked at performance without these paper losses or, or other things. And uh, um, as I said, I'm happy to to step through what what I have if anyone's interested. Yeah, I totally agree, Bob. That is, that it was really well put, and and I certainly am on board with uh, with the points you've made and that we've made um, in meetings together. Other questions? Or are we going to cede some time back to Vic and maybe wrap up a little early? Take it away, Vic. Thanks very much. Uh, Larry, uh, that was really a very enlightening discussion for me, especially. Um, um, well, I, I want to thank the, uh, the speakers and uh, the presenters and the discussants and the uh, and people who were attending who uh, asked such uh, insightful questions. I think we've raised a lot of issues here, especially uh, uh, on the on the pre-funding and retirement uh, question is whether uh, this is whether political gridlock is going to prevent major reforms or not. Uh, I think that uh, Michael Plunkett brings up a lot of issues on pricing. Uh, some of them uh, kind of resonate from uh, other industries. For example, an electric utility, large customers, commercial customers, are subject to much more sophisticated tariffs and, and uh, they like it that way. Um, and uh, uh, opening up uh, and uh, taking into account last mile and uh, uh, issues was uh, uh, there's where uh, a lot of the play is going to be uh, that uh, Jim was talking about is, uh, is, is sounded very interesting. Um, my thought, uh, uh, my thought experiment, I don't know if it's, it's useful or not, but it, it, uh, perhaps, uh, uh, puts, uh, uh, puts some of the issues in a different perspective. Anyway, uh, Dave, did you want to conclude, uh, add anything? 
I thought this was a, a really insightful and a, a very good discussion. And I suspect it'll lead to um, other discussions in future webinars. Dave, did you have anything to add? Um, no, I thought it was very valuable. I liked everyone's uh, contribution very much. And we certainly had a lot of the important talent uh, online today and, and in the audience. I'm very excited and encouraged by the House and Senate bills, but I, I also understand and agree with the point that uh, you can't just cut off, it's not enough to just end pre-funding. You do need to make sure that the fund doesn't die and the current bills have no safeguard of that. It leaves the investments with the treasury um, paying, paying almost nothing. Uh, the interest rates certainly would, I think, if they run up a point and a half, which they would if they were not controlled, uh, the funds would be, again, fully funded. The search goes on for a surrogate for efficient market forces to make sure that uh, if we remove a lot of the controls and constraints, that uh, the prices won't, won't simply go up. But so far, nobody's broken the code on... Uh, the surrogate for efficient market forces. Um, Mike Plunkett raised a critically important thing, point where we are, where we ought to be in the United States is on the edge of um, evolving the amazing work of uh, work share into its next um, form. And that's gonna require, I think it will require um, a very open, valuable dialogue with the customers. And I think that that has been lacking. We need to, the next change isn't going to be an incremental change. It has to be an evol, it has to be a transformative change. And, and Michael suggested um, one that's probably most probable. Failing that, uh, I'm afraid we're going to just keep kicking the can down the road and, and inching forward. Um, if if um, we do receive additional funds from Congress to uh, to pay for the, the the provision of postal services to all Americans, I think it has to be understood that when Congress stops paying, the postal service is free to discontinue providing the service that they insisted on. Um, I. You can't help, it's impossible not to be disappointed with Congress in this matter. Um, they, they do need to undo the damage that they've caused. Um, and, and I think that at the moment of passage, if you look back at that time, the Postal Service was doing well. I'm not sure they needed much help, but now they're desperately in need of somebody undoing the damage that's been done. And uh, thanks for involving me in this. I liked it a lot. Hey, Dave, can I just add one more thing about your comment about uh, work sharing? It, it will be great to have additional forms of work sharing and to think those through and to add them. And it's been wonderful for the Postal Service. I would also point out, though, that moving work sharing closer to efficient component pricing from where the Postal Service has failed to implement it for years, and now the PRC has pushed them in that direction, is not a bad first step to make those discounts actually reflect better the avoided cost upstream so that the most efficient person winds up doing the work. And so I'm looking forward to additional forms of work sharing, but also to see what happens when we implement the rules that the PRC implemented in the 10 year review to get closer. Thanks. These are hugely important issues and I fear they're not on the radar. Hmm. Okay, well, thanks again, everybody. And uh, we'll be uh, uh, figuring out other webinars or uh, actual meetings if uh, the COVID pa uh, pandemic is over uh, in next month or two. Take care, everybody.